For four and twenty hours, the storm and a restless tumult had blown so exceedingly as we could not apprehend in our imaginations any possibility of greater violence. Yet did we still find it not only more terrible, but more constant. Fury added to fury, and one storm urging a second more outrageous than the former. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tungsalvala, the show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. When the sea venture set sail, it took Argyll's new, faster route with the largest fleet that the Virginia Company had ever sent to Jamestown. Off the coast of Bermuda, the sky grew dark and the wind made the waves so violent that it was forced to abandon its pinnace. The crew and passengers couldn't see, they couldn't hear each other, and they were so consumed by motion sickness that they could barely think. The fibers that sealed the seams of the ship began to come loose, and soon five feet of water had entered the ship. The mariners went to plug the leak, and instead they found dozens of small holes, which they tried to plug as fast as they could with whatever they could, including slices of beef. But the water continued to rise, and as they saw thousands of biscuits floating in the water they knew that the food stores were flooded and for three days and four nights every person on the ship took shifts to pump and pour the water out of it with even the captain and governor taking turns the only person who didn't participate was admiral george summers who worked without sleep to steer the ship as smoothly as possible the ship was now filled with nine feet of water though and people began to resign themselves to their fate. Some managed to get a drink and toast a meeting in the next world. They threw everything, including their guns, beer, oil, cider, wine, and vinegar overboard, but it was too late to be helpful. They shut the hatches, committed their sinful souls to God, and their ship to the mercy of the sea. At that moment, Summers saw land and two rocks between which he could lodge the ship. The wind died down, the ship stopped sinking, and peace suddenly replaced the violence. The hurricane had passed. Using a longboat, they got all the passengers, all remaining possessions, all livestock, and the dog to shore safely. They were in Bermuda, and the Devil's Isles seemed to be paradise. There were no native inhabitants, but there were plenty of wild hogs from previous Spanish expeditions. There were fish, birds, eggs, turtles, shellfish, and fruits, and palmettos to eat. They dubbed a sweet but thorny plant the prickle pear. The weather was perfect, the water was beautiful, but they were stranded, and they also held the new leadership and instructions for the governing of the colony. And they knew that in the absence of Thomas Gates's leadership, that meant that a power vacuum would soon emerge in Jamestown. Jamestown would have to wait, though. First, they had to take care of the ship's crew and passengers, so they built shelters from palm leaves and planted muskmelons, peas, radishes, onions, and lettuce. They preserved their surplus and remained well-fed during the autumn and winter. They salvaged everything but the ship's ribs from the sea venture. Their shipbuilder, Richard Frobisher, who was doubtless related to the Elizabethan explorer Martin, attached parts from the ship to the longboat, and added a mast and oars to create a messenger boat that was sturdy enough to take eight men to Jamestown, which they estimated to be about 450 miles away. That boat would tell Jamestown what had happened, and Jamestown could use its pinnace to pick up the rest. The risks were too great for Gates to go personally, so he sent instructions and appointed people to act as leaders until he arrived. This leadership included one-time Cecil spy Peter Wynne. Finally, Gates wrote the names of the people who he feared were most likely to try and take over Jamestown, but unfortunately we have no idea whose names were on it. The modified boat made its way through the reefs surrounding the island, and the colonists waited for either Jamestown's pinnace or Lord Delaware's fleet. It's worth taking a minute now to introduce you to some of the people on board the Sea Venture, because not only will these people be important to the history of Jamestown and even Plymouth, They also show the changing face of the colony under the Second Charter. There are some familiar names here, like a demoted Christopher Newport and obviously Peter Wynne. Thomas Gates had been 
chosen as the new governor of Jamestown by the Virginia Company until Cecil demoted him at the last minute and made Lord Delaware governor. He had sailed with Drake and been mentored by Essex, and he had intended to go to Virginia in 1607, but went to fight in the Low Country instead. A year later, he requested a leave of absence and headed west. George Summers, like Gates, was named on the 1606 Virginia Company Charter. He was an old Elizabethan privateer and one of the most respected mariners of his time. At the same time, no one really had anything bad to say about his character. Half a century after his death, he was remembered as, quote, a lamb on the land so patient that few could anger him, and a lion at sea so passionate that few could please him. Even on Bermuda, he consistently worked for the good of the company, charting the land and hunting and fishing every day. Also on board were Stephen Hopkins, who would later sign the Mayflower Compact, Richard Buck, a Cambridge-educated minister, William Strachey, a lawyer-turned-poet who had spoken in England to Wahoon Seneca's brother, Machumps, and he'd been the person who had learned of the Roanoke settlers' fate. Interestingly, he was also a friend of William Shakespeare and probably part of the same secret drinking club, the Cyrenicals. Shakespeare wrote The Tempest based on Strachey's account of the Sea Venture's wreck. George Yardley was on board, as was John Rolfe, who was carrying seeds of a Trinidad strain of tobacco that someone had given him in London. Tobacco was extremely fashionable in England, and it had been popularized by Sir Walter Raleigh. James didn't approve of it, and because of his regulations and Spanish dominance of the New World, the English had to buy it from Spanish producers at high prices. They were looking for an alternate source of supply. This was a very different group than had come to Jamestown previously, and it followed a major restructuring of the Virginia Company. These colonists were largely members of the same class, which was children of successful merchants. This fit the company's re-envisioning of the colony as largely a trading venture modeled in part on the East India Company, but it also marked a distinct social change within Virginia itself. People like Gates and Summers certainly fit the old mold. Distinguished adventurers and members of the social elite, along with servants. But the merchant class had been essentially unrepresented in the early colony. They were a very different and relatively new class of people. Most came from London or the port cities, and they tended to live relatively quiet lives. They also tended to be some of the richest people in England, far richer than the struggling aristocrats and unemployed workers who had characterized the early colony. Because they were rich, and they'd gotten rich in part by investing in profitable ventures, they were eager to invest in various colonial projects, whether or not they intended to actually take part in the danger themselves. In addition, King James's willingness to sell aristocratic titles for a high enough price meant that a fair number of them, like the Earl of Warwick, emerged with titles as well and therefore representation in the House of Lords. They were quickly outpacing the other classes in both wealth and influence. The Puritans came largely from this class of people, and indeed the coming era of Jamestown history would be dominated by them, and the colony would have a strong Puritan influence for the next few years. There were even Brownist separatists, the same strain of radical Calvinists that the Mayflower pilgrims belonged to. Brownists rejected the Puritan idea of reform within the Anglican Church and wanted to create separate churches which adhered to their theology. Within England, everyone was forced to attend Anglican churches, so they, like so many dissident religious sects, looked toward the New World. These were the people who had gone to Holland, and now they were looking for a place in America where they could be free from the authority of the English government. One of the leaders of the Virginia Company, Edwin Sandus, had actively tried to recruit Brownists to go to Virginia. It was a different group of people living comfortably on a tropical island, but there was no escaping factional conflict. Summers argued that he was in charge of the colony until the crew and passengers reached their destination, which was Virginia. And Gates took the role of governor within Bermuda because they were on land, not at sea. 
The two factions split, with Summers taking 20 men to a nearby island, while the rest of the people stayed with Gates. The bigger conflict, however, occurred when no boat arrived at Jamestown. Wynne's modified longboat had been lost at sea, never to be heard from again. And so Frobisher started to build another boat, this one from scratch, using some lumber from the ship, some from the local forest, and manufacturing his own pitch and tar. Summer's group also started to build their own vessel. At this point, six people, including a brownist named John Want, led an effort to keep the colonists in Bermuda. Life in Bermuda was good. There was plenty of food, no hostile local people, and they didn't have to obey the adventurers who came before them or the rules of some London-based company. Technically, they were outside of the influence of the English government, too, and being outside of an established English company patent was a perfect situation for a brownist, and it was the situation that the pilgrims would find themselves in almost a decade later. Even Summers wanted to stay in Bermuda. Gates, on the other hand, was ever wary of the situation in Jamestown. Everyone in London knew about the factional conflict threatening to tear the colony apart, and the sea venture's supplies and directions were meant to turn a struggling outpost into a thriving colony. Without either, there was no telling what would happen in Virginia. In addition, the Virginia Company had paid their voyage, and they were under contract. This wasn't just about them. It was about the colonists and the shareholders, too. To prevent the spread of dissent, Gates banished the agitators to a nearby island and condemned one to death, only pardoning him after others asked him to be lenient. This didn't stop the spread of dissent, though, and soon more separatists emerged, and one was even caught stealing supplies to take a group of survivors to a nearby island to stay permanently. He was shot to make it clear there would be no more separatist talk. It wasn't long before both groups of colonists had completed the construction of their ships, the deliverance and the patience, and were ready to set sail for Jamestown in what they believed would be a 450-mile journey. Under Summers' secret instruction, three men did stay behind so that England could claim continual inhabitation and possess Bermuda as a colony. Each group erected a cross with a description of how they ended up there, they packed as much food as they could and set sail. Ten days later, and about 300 miles further than they expected, they arrived in Virginia. The first Englishmen they met were at Cape Henry, at a settlement named Fort Algernon in honor of Percy's nephew, the future Earl of Northumberland, where they exchanged news with the settlement's leader, James Davies. Jamestown, Davies said, had been doing badly, but he and his men had been living well on some hogs that they'd fattened with an unexpected oyster surplus. They were one of three new settlements that had been established, along with one at Nansemond and the other at Point Comfort, but only theirs remained. The others had been abandoned and their inhabitants had been forced back to Jamestown. A few weeks before, Percy, who had just recovered from a long illness, had visited the fort to tell Davies that he'd have to take half of Jamestown's survivors. Davies had protested, saying that he had no food or accommodation for them, and that he was facing increasing hostility from neighboring Kegatan Indians. Percy had responded that he should prepare for an imminent influx of sick and starving men, but nothing had been heard from Jamestown since. Gates's crew continued to sail up the James River and finally reached the little wooden fort that had been their destination for nearly a year. They landed and entered the fort, and Strachey was surprised by how substantial a settlement Jamestown was. It had buildings and a nicely furnished church, but it was completely empty and a shambles. It looked more like the ruins of an ancient fort than one that was supposed to be inhabited. The church's things were knocked over and in disarray, and there didn't seem to be anyone around. They rang the church bell, and a handful of people began to crawl out, some naked, saying simply, We are starved. We are starved. George Yardley recognized his wife Temperance, and the new Reverend Buck gave a prayer. Gates delivered his position, and Percy handed in his old commission, tired and relieved not to be president anymore. 
The new arrivals quickly fed everyone in the fort, and Percy began to tell Gates what had happened. They had, as you remember, had only three months' worth of food supplies when the last ship left Jamestown. Making the most of absolutely everything, they run out of food in the middle of February. They were getting desperate for more food, so Percy sent Martin to Nansman to trade with the Kikatan, and Ratcliffe to Cape Comfort to set up a permanent settlement to act as a lookout for shipping and to support fishing. Percy had been relieved when Wahoon Seneca sent an envoy led by Thomas Savage to bring venison, and he told Savage to go back with gifts to ask the leader about buying some corn. Savage didn't want to leave and only agreed when Spellman agreed to accompany him. Soon, Martin returned, having abandoned his post in what was a shocking, though perhaps not entirely surprising, display of cowardice. He left a soldier named Michael Sycamore in charge, a man who was held in much higher regard than he was. And so Percy immediately sent a search mission to find Martin's abandoned crew. He found the lieutenant alive but alone. His men had fled to Kikatan and asked for refuge. Their bodies were found a few days later, with their mouths stuffed full of bread. When Spellman returned from Orpox, the new Powhatan capital, he brought Wahun Seneca's son and daughter and a message saying that the Powhatan would trade copper for corn. Smith had warned that this type of thing could be a trap because there was a drought and no one in the area had enough food, but Smith had also said that those claims might have been a lie to give the Powhatan a trade advantage. The English were desperate, though, and Percy had no real choice but to try, so he sent Spellman with a reply that the pinnace would shortly be at Orpox. He recalled Ratcliffe from Point Comfort to take the two teenagers and 50 soldiers to Orpox. They were escorted to the corn and negotiated a price for it. At this point, the Powhatan left the English to carry the baskets back to their ship. When the English found that the baskets had false bottoms and were nearly empty, they were chased back to their boats by the Indians, and right before they reached the river, carrying whatever corn they could, they were ambushed by warriors. Two soldiers managed to escape, and the rest were killed. Ratcliffe was escorted away alive. Spellman, Savage, and Samwell escaped, though, and John Smith later theorized that they had been tipped off by Pocahontas. The soldiers who had escaped watched as a fire was kindled at the foot of a tree, and Ratcliffe was stripped of his clothes and tied to it. A group of women then proceeded to cut his flesh and organs from his body, throwing them piece by piece into the fire until nothing was left. Percy's gamble didn't pay off, and the colony collapsed. Fearing no reprisals from Smith, the Paspahe Lage sieged the fort, shooting anyone who dared to leave it. They also slaughtered the settlers' livestock, leaving them rotting in the field and shooting anyone who tried to retrieve the bodies. The settlers' only hope was to make contact with groups beyond the Powhatan Dominions, either in the northern regions of the Chesapeake or south toward Choanoc, the land of the tribes who had probably taken in the Roanoke settlers. Percy sent west to trade with the Patawomics in the north of the Chesapeake. He managed to fill his pinnace with corn, but in some sort of altercation he had beheaded and cut off the limbs of two people, antagonizing the tribe. While they were sailing back to Jamestown, they ran into Davies' men at the falls, and Davies told them about the colony's starvation and told them to get back with the food as fast as possible. West's men decided that that wasn't a situation they wanted to be in, so they forced West to sail for England, never leaving the food at all. Davies described the mutineers as professed pirates with dreams of mountains of gold and happy robberies, who at one stroke had wrecked the hope of the colonists. They actually went up to Newfoundland, after which some returned to England and others had, in fact, joined pirate ships. Percy himself tried to go to meet the Choanox, but there was no ship remaining. One ship was at Fort Algernon, another was at Cape Comfort, and West's men had stolen another. That only left one ship, the Discovery, and that had gone adrift, floating four miles downstream. With the siege, none of the sailors dared to retrieve it until Percy emerged from his house, sword drawn and seemingly ready to use it. Tucker built another large fishing boat by hand, but there were no fish in the river. It was still useful enough and boosted morale just enough to keep the people from killing each other. 
There was no food at this point, though. People had finished the food from the ship's stores and then eaten every animal brought from England, and then just walked around picking up anything that looked even remotely edible. First horses, then pigs, dogs, cats, rats, mice, vermin, fungi, and toadstools, and then anything made out of leather. Hugh Price broke under the strain of the now unbearable hunger. He wandered the streets uttering blasphemies and left the fort with a butcher, only for the two to be shot to death by Indians. They found his body torn apart by wolves, though oddly the butchers remained intact except for the arrow wounds. The colonists had recently buried a slain Indian, and at this point they dug him up and butchered him. This was the beginning of the cannibalism that you hear about. When the pregnant wife of a man named Collins disappeared, Collins searched his cabin and found her preserved remains. Under an increasingly stressed Percy's torture, Collins confessed to the murder and was, at Percy's orders, burned at the stake. Percy himself was dealing with a bout of his illness, and as soon as he was well enough, he prepared to go to Fort Algernon to see how the people there were doing, and to see if he could revenge the killing of his men by the Kikatan. At Algernon, Percy found the men enjoying such plentiful food that they were feeding the surplus to their pigs. He felt that Davies had intentionally concealed his plenty from Jamestown, and that even the food they'd given the pigs could have saved multiple people's lives. Percy felt that they were preparing to leave for England with the, quote, better sort, and to leave Jamestown to fend for itself. He told Davies that he'd be sending half of his men to Fort Algernon to get some food, and then the other half, and if that wasn't fast enough to save people's lives, he'd bring everyone from Jamestown to Fort Algernon. Another fort might be erected and built, he said, but men's lives, once lost, could never be recovered. While they were waiting for the tide to take the first wave of settlers to Fort Algernon, Gates's two pinnaces arrived, and thus ended the starving time. In the spring, the Powhatan lifted the siege so that they could do their own spring planting. Archer had died during the starving time, and in all, only 60 of 200 settlers remained in Jamestown. Not all of them died. A fair number had gone to live with the local Indians. They would never return to Jamestown, but later settlers recalled seeing them there. It had been the most gruesome and trying ordeal that the colony had yet faced, and believe me when I say that I left out some of the more appalling details. Smith blamed the colony's leadership, and a lot of people since have taken that approach, saying that Percy's lack of leadership skills allowed the situation to get as bad as it did. Others have blamed the colonists for their laziness, but recent scholars have noted that despair can push people to inactivity, and that when people see no escape, they don't work toward one. I have my own opinions on this, but instead of saying them now, I'll leave it up to you. What do you think? Anyway, now the Sea Venture settlers and Jamestown survivors were together. After six months of starvation, they had relief. Gates and Summers had arrived on homemade pinnaces, though. They had been able to create bounty in Bermuda, but their ships were just big enough to get them to Jamestown, not them and excess supplies. So Gates counted his supplies and calculated, and he figured out that even stretching what they had to the absolute maximum, they only had 16 days worth of food left. And with that news, it was time to make a decision. To leave Jamestown would not just mean abandoning a tiny wooden fort on the Chesapeake Bay. It would mean letting all of North America fall into Spanish hands and most likely giving up the dream of a Protestant empire completely. It would mean letting down the shareholders who had invested so much in the venture, and with a second major failure, it would be years before investors decided to fund another American colony. By that time, France and Spain would inevitably have asserted their dominance, and England wouldn't have another chance. It wasn't a light decision, but the survivors couldn't endure anymore, and Gates decided that the colonists should leave, go to Newfoundland, and from there to England. They'd make arrangements in Newfoundland to transport passengers with other ships passing through the area. 
Everyone celebrated and some wanted to burn the fort to keep it from falling into Spanish hands. But Gates prevented them, saying that, quote, people as honest as us might come to inhabit here. They buried the cannons in the ordnance and packed any remaining supplies and valuables onto the ships. And by noon, they were on their way. Gates was the last to leave the island just to make sure that no one decided to burn the fort. And the homemade fleet started to sail back up the James toward the Atlantic. Thanks for listening. If you have any opinions, thoughts, or theories about anything we've discussed in the show, I'd love to hear from you either on Facebook or Twitter. And you can find those links at the website, AmericanHistoryPodcast.net, as well as links to first-hand accounts and things. See you next week.